Thank you very much. We'll have now a keynote conversation about global challenges with a perspective from the South. We have three first-class commentators. First, we'll speak uh, Jose Antonio Campo from the Central Bank of Colombia. Then, Vera Songwi of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And finally, the third one will be Thomas Tocher from the Friedrich Newman Foundation. There are many questions that could be raised concerning the subject of the conversation. And I suppose they have also many questions to raise. I only will mention two questions that perhaps from our point of view could be important to have in mind. The first one is it is possible to mitigate the impacts of the actual deterioration of the rule-oriented multilateral trade system in developing economies. And the second question would be how to build success stories of working together among developing countries at the regional level, especially through competitive sectorial productive networks. In the first round, each of the members of the conversation will have something as five minutes to make the first commentaries. And then we'll have a second round. So I give the floor to Jose Antonio Ocampo. You want to speak from here? Thanks. Well, thank you, Felix, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, in this uh, T20 summit. Let me uh, perhaps uh, start by, uh, in relation to this question, that the, the first and most important issue is actually to save the rules-based international trading system. I mean, the, the challenges that the WTO has are immense. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, the most important in the, in the next few months is to, to avoid the collapse of the dispute settlement mechanism of WTO, uh, which is one of the jewels of international cooperation. Now, in relation to the capacity of, uh, let's say, of developing countries to uh, compensate for that, uh, I think it's limited. Uh, notably, uh, among other reasons, because the, the major, uh, let's say, leader in terms of international trade for developing countries has been China, and China has been the country that, ha uh, that has been most affected by U.S. protectionism. So how much uh, it can compensate is a, is a big uh, question mark. In, uh, in, in other things uh, you know, can be done, uh, but uh, I, I must uh, say that uh, in terms of regional integration, for example, Latin America used to be the leader, but there has been a significant uh, erosion uh, in terms of the cooperation uh, that, has been, uh, that has taken place. Uh, so that many of the uh, integration agreements of Latin America have weakened because of political confrontations uh, among countries, and I think that has to be overcome, uh, and we have to return to that. Now, but aside from this issue of trade, uh, let me mention uh, at least three. One in passing, which I think is the most important issue, which is international migration, mm -hmm. uh, which is now perhaps the, uh, the most important collapse of uh, in, a, in the process of globalization. 
The, the second is uh, international tax cooperation, uh, which there have been some advances uh, through the uh, base erosion of profit shifting initiative uh, of the G20 led by, by OECD. Uh, but it, it is still limited and the digital economy in particular is presenting challenges that were not addressed in the best process and, and are, uh, are really important uh, ahead. Let me perhaps in this initial, uh, at least uh, participation at least mentioned, and I'll probably go back to this, the, the issue of the uh, emerging country crisis that uh, has, been, has started and uh, so far it has been concentrated in a few countries, uh, notably in uh, Turkey and Argentina, uh, but it has also already spread to some others, uh, let's say Brazil, South Africa, uh, a few more, and, and the big question is where the international community is ready uh, to manage uh, and avoid, uh, manage this uh, initial crisis and avoid uh, uh, its spread throughout the developing uh, world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Antonio. And I will ask Vera to make her intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe, for uh, having us here. Thanks to the government of Argentina for all the service, and to Julia in particular for making sure that we came uh, well from a very, very long trip. I think when we go directly into talking about the multilateral trading system, one forgets that you know, in the last 20 years, we can actually say that globalization and trade have delivered on the promise of creating, generating growth, creating prosperity and you know, really bringing a lot more people out of poverty, including in China. So I think when we start by just going to, is there a crisis, without understanding what the gains have been, today we are talking about trade in goods and services of about $14 trillion. Even though we know that between 2016 and 2017, according to the last WTO numbers, there has been some abatement of global trade and it seems like in 2017 because of the push uh, um, uh, in terms of protectionism, we may be seeing slower global trade in 2018. The important thing is we must continue to protect a global trading system, and there I fully agree with you that one sure way, and all our analysis, I think, of uh, all of us in this room, academics, shows that trade does indeed pull people out of poverty, and that trade is the best way. But you must have trade associated with foreign direct investment with investment that works and works in a good way. Now, when we talk about a rules-oriented multilateral trading system and the impacts of its deterioration on economies, particularly where the geography where I come from, which is Africa, I think we begin to see three things. One of the first is the question around standards. I think that when we have a multilateral trading system that agrees on the standards for goods and services and how we exchange them, then it's very easy for countries in the developing world to ensure that they can meet those standards and access the, the developed uh, world's markets. If you have a system where the standards begin to be set individually in bilateral systems, then it becomes a very difficult issue. And I think that we had made a lot of progress in terms of harmonizing standards, particularly in the agricultural sector, where exactly a lot of the African countries are coming out of just exporting commodities into manufacturing and selling processed uh, uh, agricultural commodities. So I think this is the first area where we begin to see some tension and some risk um, um, with this deterioration of the multilateral trading system. The second one, and I think you mentioned it a little bit, we know that trade on the continent is growing, it's getting stronger. Intra-Africa trade, and we in uh, 2017 passed what we call the Kigali Declaration, which was the signing of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. This is, there has been huge momentum on the continent in terms of moving towards a collective single trade market. It will be a market of 1.2 billion people, $2.3 trillion. Africa's trade with the world is still in the single digits, but we believe that as we grow our markets and as we become one single market, we will be able to do that better. But the only way that we can then move from regional trading blocks into a global trading system is that this rules-based system works, particularly for e-commerce. And there again, I think this is the discussion around cybersecurity, financial systems, and payment services. If we cannot have clarity on what we do around e-commerce, if we cannot have clarity on how we manage financial services, the whole issue around know your client, 
what is it that banks do? Today we're talking a, a huge part of trading is the financial system and the financial sector. What kinds of rules and regulations we have around Know Your Client, which allow you to be able to buy processed cocoa from uh, 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 Cote d'Ivoire and sell it in a UK market through a bank that is certain that it's meeting all the rules and regulations and the standards. This is what the multilateral trading system avails us. So it's particularly important that we continue to work to ensure that it is uh, a system that is functional and effective. We know, uh, uh, and the third point that I wanted to bring is on the issue of services and technology again. In Africa, we are watching a continent that is going to be much younger, that is going to be invigorated, that is going to be able to have a lot more knowledge. And again, around the rules-based multilateral trading system, a question that we must have a conversation around is intellectual property rights. How can you protect intellectual property rights? This is a big issue that I think we, from the developing world, now find as a quintessential problem for our youth who are going to be coming up with new designs, new methodologies for the fourth industrial revolution. We believe on the continent it is going to actually take off in Africa because that is where the innovation, the creativity is going to come. But then how do you protect that? Inside the multilateral trading system, we have had discussions. We haven't reached a conclusion yet, but we have had at least a global space where we can have these discussions. And so I think that a big impact of a deterioration of that space is going to be that we see counterfeit, we see, you know, so we will not just be talking about terrorism or anti-money laundering and all that around illicit financial flows, but you will have the whole issue around intellectual property rights, which in, in a sense is a negative of the income on the continent and for us something very important. So three things, it's just trade is still good, trade works, Africa is moving towards it, the financial systems, know your client, how we can solve that and ensure that there is a global standard around that. In services, the know your client banking sector system, how we can continue to have that discussion in a multilateral space, and finally, intellectual property rights. I think those are the three issues that we hope we can keep a system that can have us have discussions on them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera, for your concrete proposal. And I will invite now Thomas to make his commentaries. Thank you so much, Mrs. Chairman. Um, first of all, let me thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. And um, many things have been said already. So probably my first point is uh, just to analyze a little bit um, how could it happen that such a good thing like uh, free trade uh, is so much under pressure? And um, how uh, could we probably explain this backlash of uh, globalization? And my answer is uh, rather simple. Um, I think that um, most uh, challenges of the future are globally. The impacts are locally. And politics is nationally. So we have a kind of dilemma or a trilemma um, that uh, worldwide, um, and basically in the aggregate, um, the impacts of globalization are, are positive. But that probably on the local level, many people think that uh, the benefits are distributed in an unfair manner, so that they are gonna call for some political action. And all politics can do is on national scale, even if nobody doubts that the new challenges in the 21st century have a global scale and should be attacked and uh, approached uh, on a global level, then they are gonna act nationally. And what can they do on a national level? They could do a kind of visible hand to fight against the invisible hand of markets, and what's the visible hand of politicians? It's searching for protectionism. And so my first point is that we should be concerned about how could we solve this trilemma that all politicians worldwide, they are elected on national scale, but they have to solve global challenges. 
And so this leads me to the two questions that have been addressed uh, this morning. Uh, the first question is how could we reanimate, reestablish, bring back in power the WTO, the multilateral system that has undoubtedly brought a lot of economic advantages worldwide in the last 50 years. And I think what is needed is a kind of two-step step, uh, procedure. In the short run, probably, yes, we have to fix some very obvious deficiencies of the WTO. Let me just mention them. Um, uh, we should probably uh, uh, enforce the weapons uh, with regard to subsidies or taxes. Um, the topic of intellectual property protection is already mentioned, has been already been mentioned. Uh, the settlement of disputes is an issue that we should solve very quickly. But I think this is, uh, to, to speak it uh, mathematically, this is just um, necessary, but it is never, never uh, sufficient. It's not sufficient to really um, fight against the challenges of the 21st uh, century that are completely up this basic level of WTO that actually was concerned to somehow um, liberalize trade in goods. We have already uh, mentioned um, that uh, nowadays it's uh, trade in data or trade in services that will become important. So I think what we have to do uh, in, in, in the next round, uh, in the, probably in the longer run, uh, but we have to start now become it, become, because it will not become easier if we wait for uh, including many other issues of the 21st century. One has been mentioned, migration. I think what has completely dismissed in all the textbooks was that we have thought that trade makes the job and that trade will lead to a kind of um, convergence. What we see nowadays is that um, there is no globalization without migration. And this will even be more important in times of uh, service trade and data trade. So we have to include uh, migration issues. Uh, second, very important point. Look, um, I think um, tariffs and subsidies, they are important, yes. But the most, by far most powerful weapon of protectionism is not subsidies, it's not, it's not tariff, it is, uh, is it, it is a currency uh, devaluation. If you are going to devaluate your currency, you are going to um, uh, somehow uh, hit the economy on both sides, imports and exports, with one single sword. And um, by far, the impact of a currency devaluation is stronger than tariff and subsidies on certain products, because currency is something that affects the whole economy, import side and export side. So I think within WTO, we have also to talk about how we are going to fight against currency wars. And last point, I think um, very obviously, in, in times of uh, digitization, we have to search for some rules, worldwide rules, how to handle, how to regulate, probably also how to tax um, international companies in the big data um, sector. Last point, because this was also uh, questioned um, in the introduction, uh, would it be a good idea for certain regions in the world to do kind of regional arrangements mm -hmm. like the European Union? Should we have the same all over the world? Uh, basically, the answer of an economist would be yes, why not? It's the second best solution, but this is not a new idea. And empirical experience says that uh, it was never successful in the past. And why was it not successful? Because neighbor may not trust each other about how to share the benefits. And they will not probably somehow trust about the division of power within an integrated area. So my last point is, yes, you could start probably with regional arrangements, but this, is, this will never, never um, be a substitute for a worldwide multilateral system. Never, because the challenges are globally and you cannot tackle them on a regional scale. So I think what we could
could probably discuss here on the summit is um, how we could strengthen the WTO, the multilateral system, somehow to uh, bring back the rules of law and to avoid the rules of power. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I have two or three questions related with the questions that you have mentioned in each of your intervention. And the first one for the three would be, do you think that really developing countries are prepared to make concrete proposals about how to modernize the multilateral trade system. And I raise this question because last Friday, meeting of Minister of Trade, it seems, according to the final declaration, that there is already an agreement that something must be done to modernize the international trade system. At the same time, on the 25th July, meeting between the President of the United States and the President of the European Commission. In the final declaration again, there has been the creation of a working group to discuss some specific issues. But I don't foresee, the post for the time being, any kind of proposal by the developing countries about how to modernize the international trade system. And having in mind that finally, the modernization of the international trade system should be approved within the framework of the World Trade Organization and with 164 members. The other question would be how to avoid the reproduction of a kind of dock around experience in which everyone meets, say what they think must be done, but there is no possibility of arriving to a consensus. So perhaps I have other questions, but these questions could be interesting. I offer the floor. Well, le let me say that... Um, in the same order. The same order, but on, in relation to uh, your first question, I, 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 my answer is probably no. There's probably no proposal uh, from the developing countries as such uh, to try to uh, manage the, um, the international trading system in a better way. Uh, but I want to underscore in particular uh, the issue of dispute settlement. Uh, in, uh, in the negotiations between uh, the U.S. and Mexico, uh, essentially the similar mechanism uh, was significantly undermined. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the uh, incapacity to, uh, uh, to elect the members of the dispute settlement mechanism uh, is a really major issue uh, for WTO. Uh, more, furthermore, for the best thing that has worked in WTO, so I, I think the, uh, the need to, uh, for developing countries as a group uh, to make proposals to, uh, uh, to uh, first of all, to uh, revitalize, revitalize the, uh, the international trading system uh, is very important. Uh, uh, and the dispute settlement mechanism in that regard uh, is, uh, is quite important. Uh, let me say that there are also uh, other issues uh, that uh, have been uh, mentioned here that, are, that I want to, uh, to, uh, to underscore. The, the first is what is, uh, how the world is going to manage the digital economy uh, in, in its multiple manifestations, you know, from the digit, digital trade, digital payments, the uh, crypto assets uh, that, that are developing issues that are in the agenda of the T20 and, 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 but have not been subject to a, to a, a significant discussion. It's, it's very uh, partial discussion. Uh, for example, again, in the, in the discussions uh, led by the G20 and that took place in, uh, uh, under the leadership of OECD on international tax cooperation, 
the issue of the tax implications of the G digital economy uh, uh, have not really been addressed yet. Uh, and, and there are really massive problems uh, in that regard that uh, uh, beyond, of course, the very limited co uh, uh, macroeconomic cooperation that uh, the G20 has been unable to manage to avoid, in particular, international tax competition, uh, which is a really major issue, uh, uh, particularly for developing countries, uh, because developing countries depend much more than developed countries on corporate income taxes. Uh, and, and that problem uh, uh, is, uh, is quite important, as well as the very specific issues of how to, uh, you know, to, to manage taxation in the digital economy, uh, which uh, remains a very important issue. It's associated to trade, actually, in, in a very important way, because uh, you know, in, uh, in many occasions, the digital trade uh, 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 goes over the boundaries of countries, uh, and therefore, uh, how to manage uh, uh, it is, uh, is a central issue uh, going forward uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, new phase of globalization. Thank you very much. And Vera now, and I will ask a particular question in your case, that is, do you think that it's possible to obtain some degree of consensus concerning rules about intellectual property, having in mind experience in the recent years and in concrete agreements, even in some regions, that could be Latin America. Yes, no, um, thank you very much. Let me come to your question last because it will be with part of my answer to that. I think um, on the question of can the developing countries um, provide input into the discussions on what should be what should a new round of uh, WTO look like and, and ensure that we can save it? I think the answer is yes. And um, not just yes because it's the right thing to say, but when you have over 50 countries on the continent that have come together in the last year to sign the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, a lot of what we have been discussing, and I think we were supposed to sign in January and we ended up signing in March, is precisely because we were talking about how do you build a set of rules-based systems that will allow for dispute settlement in countries that are pretty advanced, like South Africa, which is a member of the G20, but also that will favor countries like Burkina Faso or Benin that are all beginning to get into the international trading space. And I think that the, 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 the very fact that we were able to bring over 50 countries together today, in Kigali we had 44 that signed, but since Kigali we've had another six that have joined us. So we have 50 countries on the continent that have come together to say we can sit on the same platform and discuss trade. And I think the discussion around what kinds of dispute settlement systems we have is something that is alive and well. And unlike when we had the first round or the Doha round, where we had not essentially on the continent began to have this regional discussion, I think today we have a lot of examples, a lot of issues that we can bring to the table with the force of experience. I think the second thing is the whole issue around rules of origin. And I think, again, in the initial WTO rounds, the rules of origins disposition, and I think that's a little bit what's happening with the NAFTA, where did not necessarily favor the developing countries in the way that we would like them to. Because today we want to be part of the global value chains, but part of the value addition part of that global value chain, and not just the raw materials part. And initially in the earlier WTO discussions, we were mostly as developing con countries considered, you know, the sort of raw materials part, and so you have the raw materials treaties and things that were being signed and you had to export 20%. We don't want to do that anymore. We want in the pharmaceutical space, for example, to actually produce the goods. And so we need to look at differences. And so if you decide that you want to have a pharmaceutical industry in the West and your rules of origin say that Africa can only contribute with raw materials, we reject that proposal. And I think that it is a, this is the space now where we can have a new discussion around how does Africa enter into global value chains? How do rules of origin enter into the discussion on the multilateral trading system? And we have now done that under the CFTA, so we know how to take this discussion forward. On e-commerce, I think that Africa now is one of the countries that is trading the most on electronic platforms simply because we didn't have earlier systems, so we have leapfrogged into a slightly better trading system. And I think that that is why Africa is insisting 
that the discussion on e-commerce happen now because it is to our benefit. And, and so we want that discussion to start happening. We know that many parts of the world seem to say that they're not ready, but we are. And so what we have decided to do on the continent is the second part of the CFTA discussions, we will start discussing e-commerce and what kinds of rules we can bring together so that when the multilateral trading system and WTO is ready to have another discussion, we will come with an African position to those discussions. And so there, I want to answer your question that says, are we ready to come with an African position? I think what we are essentially doing, and in the next two weeks, we're actually having meetings already on the continent on what is going to be the African position around e-commerce. And again, when we talk about Africa, we're talking about South Africa, we're talking about Morocco, we're talking about Guinea-Bissau, we're talking about Rwanda, which is, I think, the diversity of those economies. The, the, our ability to be able to come together on a position will help us ensure that the precise problem that we are fighting today, which is the weakening of the multilateral trading system because people feel that they have been left behind, we can ensure that we answer those questions before we get into the system and make sure that those of us in the developing world that would like to take even more advantage of global trade can actually do it in an effective way. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to Thomas, but I will add a specific question based in your commentaries, because you spoke of glo the global level, the national level. The national level is where you find, as Vera mentioned recently, diversity, a lot of diversity, diversity of power, diversity of experiences, diversity of ideas, cultural diversity. And that gives some importance to the discussion among us about how to build consensus when you have diversity. If you want to find global solution, based on diversity, not in a w same way to think about things. Thomas, that, I give you the floor. The that, last intervention and then we must finish. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, this uh, interesting question because I think this really hits the point. Um, all the beliefs in a multilateral system are beliefs in convergence. Um, somehow you try to bring together standard of living, standards of living worldwide, and that's the promise of open markets that somehow standard of livings would converge between countries. Actually, this happened a lot over the last 50 years. But what happened also was that within the countries, you do not see such convergence processes. What you see within countries is a kind of divergence, mm. diversity in many regards, not just income and wealth, but also probably the ability to adjust to new circumstances. The dynamics to, of adjustment is uh, not converging, it is diverging. So it's indeed a question, how do we manage a world that within countries become more diverse, more divergence, a polarization probably in certain countries, with old instruments. And I think this is indeed a question that we will not solve with all tools. And that's why I'm saying that I believe the WTO, we have to understand first the mechanisms of the WTO multilateral system that was established, reminded, uh, in the 50s in completely different circumstances. And to be honest, and I think we should be open, I think, thanks to the question first, how do we go along in the future with the principle of unanimity? what has led in the last couple of years to a situation of blockade, of completely non-further development of the international, the multilateral system. Second, what we have to discuss, I mean, I know that this is probably not what you are expecting me to say, but we have to discuss somehow whether the principle of one country, one vote 
is still the best for the 21st century, or whether we should not move towards a system that we have in the IMF or in other international multinational, multinational um, institutions. I mean, um, I mean, at least I ask the questions. It's uh, your uh, uh, point then to find answers. I mean, the, the question is, do we really feel fine that a, a system that somehow has made small countries by treating every country equally, by equal treatment of every single country, this system has made small countries big and big countries small. And can we accept in the future, do we expect that others will still think that this is the best system that a small country, I'm not gonna mention one, you all have one in mind, a very tiny country has the same political power in the WTO system like big China uh, or the US. So I think we have to think about new policy decision-making systems within the WTO. And the last point has been mentioned before. I mean, uh, Albert Einstein, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, most important, probably most influential person of the last century said you cannot solve new problems with old tools. And I mean, WTO is not at all prepared for questions of digitization. And as an economist, I see digitization as nothing different than globalization. Basically, it changes the relative relations between capital and labor, and somehow it increases the supply of labor, but somehow asks again the questions about who is hit by this new technology. And are we going to do the same mistake again, that basically something that could be a huge option for economies, globalization, if we do it right and correctly? Are we gonna do the same mistake again with digitization that we are not, be, uh, that we are not gonna be able to somehow find an answer not only of the benefits that are more or less globally, but also with the impacts that always, all impacts are locally. All impacts are where people are. And this is local. And if we do not fit to somehow bridge this gap between global challenges and local adjustments, then I'm pessimistic whether we are going to benefit most of these new technologies. Thank you so much. Can I just add one thing? Because yeah. he talked about uh, trading systems and voting rights. And um, I just want to say that it's not so much the smallness or the bigness of the country. I think it's, we need some kind of equal representation and in the institutions that you mentioned, there is a big discussion around voice. And if we want to do that, we have to do it. One of the reasons why we're here is because we believe that the voice has not been equitable. So we can't move to those systems without fixing that problem. Okay. Let, me let me really report that point. Uh, because the, uh, the issue of voice and representation of developing countries is still one of the major problems of the international system. Uh, and if you go to weighted vote for everything, uh, you know, you're going to be much worse. Uh, de facto, uh, for example, in WTO, I have seen how much, you know, the developed countries are able to pressure developing countries, with few exceptions. For example, India had been the only country that had really faced, uh, you know, the developed countries seriously in one decision. Uh, but, the, but most developing countries are pressured, in a sense, to, uh, to, to go with the consensus so, uh, despite that. The issue of, uh, of voice and representation is also the major issue in the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, where the uh, you know, developing countries are significantly underrepresented. So only those issues are really overcome. There is no way you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to really fix the international cooperation system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we must finish now but I would like to add only a small commentary concerning the further discussion we must have among us with respect to the future of the rule-oriented system. And I have the impression, and I leave the idea to think about it, that we can learn a lot of soccer. 
in the sense that nobody will accept to play a game with different rules for different protagonists. And at the same time, you need to have a final guarantee of someone that will say if you really played according the rules. And that is what I perceive is the sense of the discussion for the future. Thank you very much. Many thanks to our keynote speakers for taking part in the first keynote session of the T20 Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take five minutes to reorder the stage, and then we will go on with the first plenary session.
Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have our first plenary session on climate action and infrastructure for development. The moderator of this session is Gabriel Lanfranchi, Cities Program Director at CIPEC. Please welcome him to the stage. Good morning. As you know, infrastructure for development is one of the main priorities set up by the Argentine government during the G20 presidency and has been developed under the Energy Transitions Working Group, the Climate Sustainability Working Group, and the Development Working Group. This is the first time that climate issues has been addressed under a specific working group. The T20 has focused on this set of climate-related priorities, stressing the need to address global population growth and urbanization by investing in climate resilient infrastructure. Led by four co-chairs, Amar Matachari, Dr. Yoshino, Mariano Gendra, Otmar Edenhofer, and myself, we have, an, excuse me, and more than 100 researchers from different, tasks for, uh, from different think tanks around the world we have worked and developed in four different policy briefs that I will mention. Green fiscal reform for a just energy transition in Latin America, the new urban paradigm, enhancing climate resilience through urban infrastructure and metropolitan governance, and fostering cross-border infrastructure projects for sustainable development and regional cooperation. According to the policy briefs produced in the Climate Action Infrastructure for Development Task Force, some of our recommendations are the following. Identify favor favorable political conditions for green fiscal reforms, develop comprehensive reform plans, understand fossil fuel subsidies distribution and compensation, sequencing of reforms and gradualism, foster transparency and participation, building on international links, work closely with subnational and local governments, foster the development of a new ecologically based urban model to tackle climate change, develop metropolitan governance mechanisms to promote and manage resilience more effectively, incorporate low carbon development strategies by rethinking infrastructure investments, focus on empowering cities, and make strides toward the implementation of the new urban agenda. With this said, I would like to introduce at the first place, Mr. Amar Bhattachari, who is a senior fellow at the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings Institution. His focus areas are the global economy, development finance, global governance, and the link between climate and development, including on the role of sustainable infrastructure. During the T20 process, he has been very active, and today he will share with us a keynote speech elaborated by the new climate economy, uh, named Unlocking the Inclusive Growth Story of the 21st Century, Accelerated Climate Action in Urgent Times. Amar? Thank you, Karen. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, I can uh, sincerely say that it's a real, real privilege to be standing on the stage. Uh, after a year of Argentinian leadership on the T20. Uh, and having been on this journey, it's uh, really, really, uh, you know, a signal of, of and testimony to what Argentina has achieved to see us all assembled here. Uh, as Julia Pomares said, uh, you know, one of the priorities, not of this T20, but for the world, 
is really meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and what I'm going to do is to talk about how that narrative has changed, uh, you know, uh, over time. If you remember, you know, we really started focusing on climate, you know, with uh, the uh, Stern Review 12 years ago. And at that time, the debate was very much uh, centered around whether the costs of inaction were greater than the costs of action. But today we are in a world which is very different. And the narrative has changed from costs to opportunity. And this report that I'm going to, uh, to share insights on, which was launched by the UN Secretary General two weeks ago, is really about the development of that narrative. The Global Commission brings together you know, leading people from the private sector, uh, from uh, academic community, uh, you know, ex-leaders uh, and ministers, and heads of institutions. And you know, the deliberations of this group is very much a way of setting uh, the discourse for today and for tomorrow. It is supported by a team of think tanks. Uh, Brookings is one of them. And I've had the privilege of being a leading author on the last two reports. Uh, so what I want to really say is that we are entering a new era of economic growth. Uh, and you know, this era uh, is being driven uh, really by factors that are in some sense changing the way we have thought about growth. The central proposition of this report is that we, fa we have an unprecedented opportunity to shift to a better growth trajectory that's driven by innovation, by strong investments in uh, sustainable infrastructure, uh, by uh, greater resource productivity and a circular economy, uh, and the vitality and potential of the private sector. And all these forces are coming together in a way that opens up possibilities that we really didn't have before. And these opportunities are coming about because of tremendous advances that have been made in the last dozen or so years, and because of a changing understanding of the processes of growth. Advances in technology, of course, are very evident in the energy sector, but they are much broader than that. They are about sustainable mobility, digital construction, city design and buildings, and agriculture. All of in these, all these areas, progress, if you think back, has been much greater than we had anticipated. At the same time, we are realizing the hidden side which is economic opportunities also come from the preservation of natural capital and from a circular economy and the core benefits that come from climate action. At the heart of this new approach is the dynamism that comes from sustainable cities where people can move, breathe, live better, communities can grow more strong together. Powering this new growth is completely different kinds of energy systems than we have had in the, in the world, and where fossil fuels, in some sense, are no longer really needed to drive our economies. Sustainable inv investments in agriculture and in forests can deliver greater food security, rural prosperity, strength and resilience, and ecosystems that are vibrant and resilient. And a more circular economy, as I mentioned, will cut the demand for energy intensive and primary materials more broadly and enhance the preservation of natural capital. On the other side, um, it's very important one second, to realize that the other side is that the risks and the costs with the old model are much greater than we had previously recognized. 2017, was the second hottest year since records started in 1880. And 18 of the 19 warmest years have occurred since 2000. And they've only been you know, 18 uh, years, so it tells you how hot the world has become. But also the forecast by climate sci scientists about all the things that are going to happen are now being exceeded. Whether you look at uh, Arctic summer melt, ocean circulation, disruption, accelerating sea level rise, in all these, and planetary boundaries 
are increasingly under threat. And carbon emissions are only one part of it. If you look at degradation of agricultural land, if you look at threats to freshwater and oceans, if you look at natural landscape and loss of biodiversity and ecosystems, we are stretching the boundaries of planetary boundaries now in every which way. And the worst effects you know, of this is still to come. And we know that the commitments to date will just not get us there. So the next 10 to 15 years are extremely important. The world economy will double roughly in the next 20 years. The urban population will about double in the next 30 years. And the stock of infrastructure will double in the next 15 years. These are once in history transitions. And given the scale of the investments that have to be made, we simply cannot get them wrong. Otherwise, we will sink the planet and we will sink the people that live on it. So the next 10 to 15 years are extremely law or important, so we don't lock in inefficient capital, polluting capital, and against the backdrop of a shrinking uh, carbon budget. Uh, what will it take to accelerate? So the report basically focuses on five systems, which we think are the most important for this new transformation. Uh, which is energy, cities, food and land use, water, industry, uh, and, and with it, uh, transport and a circular economy. And all of these are the sectors that we feel are the backbone of this new transformation. But to drive this transformation, we will need cross-cutting action in four very important areas. First, we have to drive change through markets. We have to be able to get, in the California Climate Summit of last week, what was very significant was the signal from the private sector that if you guys set coherent directions for future change, then the private sector can respond. And policies are not coherent within countries and across jurisdictions. Now, two that the report particularly highlights are carbon pricing and transport-related uh, disclosure. The second is accelerating investments in sustainable infrastructure, and as the G20 has emphasized this year, mobilizing the financing for it through innovation and a new public-private partnership where multilateral development finance institutions will have a key role to play. Third, we need to unleash innovation. It is remarkable how much innovation has taken, back on the, uh, has taken place on the back of middling policies. So if we get our policies right and we get our support structures right and we get innovation to where it is needed, especially in the poorest and most vulnerable countries, we, we have tremendous potential. And last, there is a need particularly to focus on inclusion and on a just transition. The change that we are talking about combines with many other changes, as the G20 highlights, and we need a better mechanism and framework for that. Now, you know, models of today are extremely poor in capturing these changes because they are based on, you know, not really what I would call economies of scale, not based on learning and self-learning, which has been what we have seen over the last decade. But, you know, with all the limitations, you know, you find that, the, that the, the impacts of even conservative models show that this new growth path can yield, yields very significant benefits. As I said, we focused on five economic uh, systems. Uh, we looked at the evidence of the benefits. We looked at challenges to scaling up implementations. We looked at what are the possible accelerators. And we looked at examples of proof, proof points. And you can read the report, but you know, through all of this, you know, there's tremendous amount that is happening also from the ground up that can provide the basis now for transformative change. And we hope that this narrative, which is so disconnected from the, some of the political discourse that we have today, will catch on with the private sector, with us here in the T20, with policymakers, and with those who continue to deny climate change and who do not recognize that this is a unique opportunity, not a tremendous cost. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now, let me introduce you these uh, amazing panelists that are joining us today. For example, at the first place in alphabetical order, we have Christoph Bayer. He is a managing director of German Corporation for International Cooperator. Cooperation, sorry. Uh, Christoph held various leading management positions within GIZ, heading the planning and development department and various regional, uh, various regional departments. Maria Eugenia Di Paola is coordinator of the Environment and Sustainable Development Program of the UNDP. She is a member of the Environmental Law Commission from the International Union for Conservation of Nature and professor of environmental law at the University of Buenos Aires. And Nayuki Yoshino is dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute and professor emeritus at Kyo University, Tokyo, Japan. P he, held, he obtained his PhD from John Hopkins University and has been a visiting scholar at the MIT and visiting professor at various universities in the world. Now, I would like you to reflect on this uh, presentation that we had, and I would like you to answer to this question one at a time. What recommendations would you give to the G20 to reap the benefits of the unprecedented opportunity to shift to a better growth trajectory and accelerate climate ac action in the short, medium, and long term? Christoph, if you would like to start. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. And first of all, I would like to thank also the organizers for having invited me. It's a great honor uh, to be here with you. As um, we, as GIZ, we are not a pure think tank. We are more focusing on the implementation side. And I think, I, I feel it's a privilege to translate a little bit our uh, practical experiences in your thinking. Um, first of all, my first comment would be um, to what, what Ama said. I can only underline what he said, that also um, from our perspective, investments in sustainable infrastructure is key, key to achieve both the, our uh, goals uh, regarding growth and our goals regarding climate change. So um, as we know also from, from uh, our council in Germany, a scientific council on global change, um, in the, the infrastructure, if we, if we keep on constructing as we do at the moment, uh, there will be no carbon spaces left for consuming, for heating, for transport, for everything. So there is a huge pressure on getting the investments in infrastructure right. And I agree, it's a good opportunity at the moment. World Bank, other multi-development banks, OECD, ourselves, we are working on standards, on, on common criteria, on definitions, that's right. And we feel also that there is an interest of the private sector, especially the construction sector, in order to become more sustainable. And there are investors looking for more sustainable investment opportunities. And infrastructure is an interesting investment asset, is an asset class by itself, which is interesting. And we have this technology, uh, technological um, uh, changes which, which makes it possible to become more sustainable. But still, what we see on our side is that there's a huge gap between what we know already, what we have to do, and what we are really doing. So uh, this is what, what, there is a gap between um, what we have in our papers and what we know and um, what we can, and what we do implement. And what is, what is the reason for this according to our observation? Maybe two things. First is, if you have a look on the very important issue of, do we have a joint common understanding on what we understand on sustainable infrastructure investment. And uh, what, what are the tools we are trying to bring this forward? What are the indicators, the standards to do so? We see that there is a huge, vast variety of those standards. So we have standards for different stakeholders, investors, governments, civil societies working on others. We have it for, for stakeholders, for project, different uh, phases in the project. We have it for different sectors. We have it for, for, for very various purposes. What we do not have yet is a coherent system where everybody knows this is, this is what we want to go for, and this is what, if I fulfill this and that, I'm on the safe side. 
this is what we have to work in. I'm, 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 I'm sure on this one. And the other side, the other thing is, if you have a look, where are the greatest infrastructure requirements in the world? We see that this is in the global south, and mainly in those regions where institutional frameworks, government framework, governance is rather weak. So there is an urgent need uh, to strengthen capacities all over the places in order to become successful in applying what we want to see in order to become uh, infrastructure investment more sustainable. And don't underestimate the problems which start if you really manage those complex issues like infra huge infrastructure investments. We are working with a lot of partners and we are again and again surprised how low the capacity is in handling such a complex management um, a challenge, you know, because you have to handle multi-stakeholders, you have to handle uh, different financial arrangements, you have to come up with proper public-private partnership agreements, you have to work between different levels of government, so it's highly complex, and most of our partners are not really prepared in order to translate in a proper infrastructure planning, into proper investment plans, and at the end to implement this in time and in the framework of costs um, uh, which you need. This has been already before we came up with our criteria on sustainability, by the way, and now it's becoming um, even more complicated. So my um, recommendation for the G20 would really be to, um, to come up with concrete proposed, concrete measures in order to strengthen the, ca the capacity. For example, to lend financial and capacity support to existing and new project preparation facilities. You know, we have worldwide exactly there where we need, where we are urgently need for more infrastructure investment, ex exactly there we have a lack of bankable projects. We do not have investable projects there. So we need more efforts in identifying those projects and helping the different stakeholders in developing them, in making those investments uh, really bankable and um, uh, investable. And uh, the other thing is, as I said before, to work together with multilateral banks, with OECD and others, to mainstream the criteria, the tools, the standards, the definitions, in order that we can really rely on, on a joint, proper um, uh, 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 yeah, system of um, uh, sustainability uh, uh, indicators. And I hope very much, last point, <laughs> I hope very much that then uh, the work which has already been done in different groups, be it from the G20 groups, the, the development group, the, the sustainable finance group, and others group, that these policy groups are really coming together, maybe under the leadership of the Japanese presidency, and we will take over what has been developed already by the G20 working groups, but also by the different engagement groups. And it's not only the T20, it's also the B20, it's the C20 and others, which, which have to be involved, as we, as we all know. So this would be my hope, that um, we can go on and build on the very valuable work which has been done under the Argentinian leadership and um, take those points up by our colleagues in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very <coughs> much, Christoph. Maria Eugenia, what would you be your thought about this? Uh, thank you, buenos dias, good morning. I would like first to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this event, CARI, CIPEC, and all the think tanks that every day work for the people and the planet. Your work with no hesitation is key to improve our lives at present and in the future. I would like also to thank Gabriel and Florencia. It is a pleasure to be here and the panelists that shared this plenary with me. Thank you. In order to start with my specific contribution, I would like to acknowledge the work that from UNDP we have been doing in order to contribute to the G20 during this year, specifically at the Energy Transitions Working Group as well as at the Climate Sustainability Working Group. Based upon this work, my speech will take some inputs from the research on long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies that UNDP prepared together with the World Resources Institute, as well as different contributions from other agencies of the system 
such as UN Environment, Habitat, International Labour Organization, and ECLAC. I would like to point out the importance of long-term strategies in order to accelerate climate action, build resilience, and inclusive growth. Why we need long-term strategies? Long-term strategies, rather than an end themselves, present a roadmap to be updated and improved as national circumstances change and new learning takes place. These strategies are living documents that can be improved over time to inform the preparation of successive NDCs. These strategies can help institutionalize action on climate change across the country and assess the sensitivity of the economy to climate change, highlighting opportunities and constraints. Global agreements and initiatives promote this important tool, such as the Climate Convention, the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework, and Agenda 2030. Also, Pope Francis, in his encyclical Laudato Si, considers this issue. Among the benefits associated with long-term strategies, to name a few. First, a long-term strategy provides an approach to align short, medium, and long-term goals, and to establish a long-term vision that guides near-term action, such as the processes for building and updating eight NDCs. Second, it is a framework for prioritizing actions and investments, and avoiding lock-in and stranded assets. Third, it develops a shared future vision involving government, private sectors, technical institutions, civil society, and other stakeholders. Main challenges associated are the appropriate use of strategic tools for long, medium, and short-term steps, actual multi-stakeholder involvement, public participation and access to information, social and gender inclusion, financial alignment with the long-term strategy as well as the different long, medium, and short-term steps, consideration of resource efficiency from the beginning of its design, implementation, and follow-up, institutional and legal framework considering a human right-based approach, just transition and access to public services, and considering infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, considering not only what I call the hardware, for example, the pipelines, grid, but also software necessities for a good governance approach, land use planning, or disaster risk reduction plans involving communities are some examples of it. Involvement of the different levels of government in its design and implementation, considering the role that cities and other subnational governments play regarding climate action and sustainable development moving to a strategic and transformational approach that is guided by a shared vision can allow countries to reap the benefits of the transition. The 2030 Agenda appeals member states to leave no one behind in its commitment to end poverty and to joint efforts to reach sustainable development based on inclusion, economic growth, and environmental protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel Kenya. Dr. Yoshino, would you like to take your time, please? Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank Argentina T20 groups supporting us. And I'm from Tokyo, Japan. T20 2019 will be held in Tokyo in May. That is why I'm sitting here. And I would like to make three comments. First one is innovation and technological progress will be very important. Second one is how to increase rate of return from green energy and fossil uh, renewable energies. And third one is taxing on CO2, NOx, and those exhaustion gases, and bring it to the rate of return on renewable energy. The first one is innovation and technological progress. In many countries, a very big hydro dam and it was needed to supply huge amount of electricity. However, technological progress made us possible to make it very compact electricity generator that can be set it up in small river, and solar power and wind power 
can be helping community. So I think huge technological progress made possible to community-oriented supply of energy. And that will enhance that diversification of energy and efficient use of energy. And furthermore, the improvement of battery saving energy will be important for green energies. So I think the first one important point is technological progress to make it possible to community level electricity will be important. Second one is how to increase bankable project. How to increase the rate of return from green energy and renewable energies. Those energies only rely on user charges. Electricity prices are usually kept in low because everybody has to use it as a public uh, goods. Then user charges are much lower compared to costs of producing renewable energy. That is why bankable projects are very scarce. Then we have to think about to bring rate of return from somewhere, not from user charges. Suppose good electricity is provided. Agricultural farmers can use tractors. And then small businesses can improve their efficiency. And large businesses will come to the region. And those spillover effects from energy will increase tax revenues. New apartment can be created, hospital can be created, then sales tax, property tax, corporate tax, income tax, they all increase. However, those increased tax revenues were not returned to infrastructure investors. All of those tax revenue went to either local government or central government. And energy supplier only received money from user charges. That is why bankable projects are very scarce. So if part of those increased tax revenues were kept on returned to infrastructure investors, then the rate of return will continue to rise and sustainable revenue will keep on coming. So that is a key driver to make bankable project much more. Lastly, taxing on CO2 NOx will be also be important to increase the rate of return from renewable energies. And that will substitute from old style energy to new style energies very quickly. And many people say it is very difficult to measure those exhaustion gases. However, technological progress, satellite data can monitor how much CO2 had been expanded from one factory to another. And that kind of technology can be utilized to many regions and then charge proper tax on CO2 and NOx and other exhaustion gases. And that, if that can be brought into incremental rate of return for renewable energy, then substitutes from old to new energy can be accelerated. So I think those are the three ways to support growth and linear energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as, as you can see, we have lots of recommendations, basically focusing on finance and also governance. I would say that these are the main challenges that we have to face if we want to have uh, climate action happening soon as we need it. Now I would like to go to the questions that we have received during this weekend from the public. And I would like uh, the panelists to go through them. These are the three questions that I have. And if you allow me, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Yoshino again, yes. asking him what financing mechanisms are available to emerging countries for the development of low carbon infrastructure. And let me add physical infrastructure as well. Thank you very much. I think public-private partnerships are very important. In public sector, many country has flow budget. Flow budget means revenue comes from tax and then spent to renewable energy and hard infrastructure. But I think many countries need not only flow budget, but also stock budget. 
Stock budget means in Germany has KFW, and Japan has and France had postal savings, post office life insurance, and pension funds. Those are the stock budget. And government pension funds, post life insurance, postal savings are collected in the second budget, stock budget, and they were used for infrastructure investment and renewable energies. So I think many countries, pension funds, government pension funds are growing. And that can be fully utilized in order to supply their money into infrastructure investment. However, traditionally, as I mentioned, renewable energy has very low rate of return in order to bring those pension funds into the investment. So we need to bring spillover tax revenues in addition to user charges to make higher rate of return for green energy and renewable energy. Then it is possible to bring pension funds and stock budget into those things. So that is a combination of public and private uh, funds. Furthermore, there are many different kinds of financing. One is bank loans. They are relatively short and medium terms, but they are also looking for rate of return. So the additional sphere of tax revenue should be put it into rate of return that can make banks even be able to finance for linear energy in short term and medium term. And long term financing is also needed. Insurance and pension funds. These are the best financing sources to invest into renewable energy. So I think variety of different kinds of sources of finance. And also, we have to make the rate of return very high. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we can develop bond market and equity market. Bond market for renewable energy could be revenue bond. In other words, rate of return from those bonds are based on coming from performance of renewable energy. And if the projects are very risky, we can bring capital and equity into those renewable energy. Lastly, community-based financing is also growing in Asian region. Green power, wind power, and solar power. The method is the following. Individuals in the region contribute about $100, $500. 200-300 people contribute those small amount of money. And then they construct solar power and wind power. And that can be supplied for the community as a whole. So I think there are two kinds of financing will be needed. One is for very large projects, public-private partnership, and community-based green power, solar power, wind power. They are collected by individuals in the region. Those dual financing will create a very thick market for financing of renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So according to your previous answers, I would like to invite Maria Eugenia first and then Christoph to answer the second question, which is what governance mechanisms should be implemented to improve coordination between national and subnational governments to implement the NDCs? Thank you, Gabriel. Well, subnational and national governments need to be involved in the process of design, implementation, and update of NDCs together with non-state actors. They also should work together on the inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. This tandem, the inventory plus the NDC designed and follow up, is fundamental in order to build a partnership from the beginning, building the baseline and following up the NDC implementation and measuring its progress. Here in Argentina, the national authorities working together with the provinces through the National Climate Cabinet and the Environmental Federal Council through sectoral and multi-stakeholder roundtables. At the same time, cities are making progress 
building their own inventories and action plans. And there is an opportunity to make the most of this information and local capacities to synergize with the other levels of government. That is to say, and to combine top-down, bottom-up, and horizontal approaches considering the local, regional, and also metropolitan specificities and contributions within a country. The pre-release of the 2018 GAP Emissions Report of UN Environment highlight the vital role of sub-national and non-state actors in propelling the global fight against climate change. Sub-national governments, as well as cities, have been working and networking for the last or more than two decades, and the outcomes of the recent San Francisco <laughs> summit emphasized the need of healthy energy systems, inclusive economic growth, sustainable communities, land and ocean stewardship, and transformative climate investments. Patricia Espinosa underscored the need for all actors to embrace inclusive multilateralism. So, I can say that we are experiencing the challenges of adequate governance coordination mechanisms, not only at the domestic, but also at the global level, in a positive way. I would like to close my intervention with a uh, quoting Achim Steiner, the UNDP administrator, who recently said, bold climate action could deliver 26 dollars trillions in economic benefits and create millions of jobs. By bringing together cities, states, private sector and civil society, the Global Climate Action Summit is setting the stage for even more ambitious action needed to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we stop. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe there's not so much left uh, after this intervention regarding the, uh, the governance issue, but I would like to mention three points or to highlight three points. First is, um, if you have a look on, 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 on governance, is corruption. I think one of the first and most important issue in to, to come up with a more sustainable infrastructure investment is to fight against corruption. I mean, have a look in the construction sectors. This is one of the worst sectors in the world if it comes to corruption. And if we do not fight successfully corruption, we will not be successful in, in, in having really sustainable infrastructure investments. This would be my first point. Yesterday with Jorge Mandelbaum, we talked about this, and there's a lot to do, um, especially all the, from the business sector itself, but jointly with the civil society and with governments setting the frame, and with the, uh, with, with the law system, which is, of course, um, uh, quite important, and to make use of, of gender approaches, of digitalization and so on, would be key also for sustainable um, uh, infrastructure investment. This would be the first point. The second point is, I totally agree with you, local governments are key. Local authority, local governments are key. But if I have a look, what has happened after the last Habitat conference in Ecuador, I don't see so much movement at this point. So I'm rather a little bit hesitant or, or, or disappointed uh, if I have a look on the, on the progress on this side. Most of the countries where we need sustainable infrastructure investment are highly too much, too much centralized. There's not a proper decentralized system with a proper ro role of local governments, strengthen them by giving them a right framework, to giving them the, the, the opportunity also to raise own income, to have a balanced fiscal system between the different uh, levels and to have a proper distribution of tasks and functions in a, in a, in a multi-layer system. So there's a huge lack of really powerful local governments. And in the end, all development is local. It has to be translated at the local level into investment plans. So there's an urgent need for decentralization and for proper, uh, 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 let's say, national environments, which allows local authorities really to perform according to our expectations. And the last point is, even if you would have this um, proper distribution of tasks and functions, balance of power, 
um, proper financial means, capacities at the local level, there's still a need for new forms of cooperation. I think you said it as well. A new form of, of as we newly are saying, co-creation and things like this, where different stakeholder groups at the local level are really trying to work together in a different way, in a new way, um, to build trust between the different stakeholders and come up with, with, no, with new, uh, um, uh, new solutions. We, we are making quite a lot good experience in, in, our, um, tr uh, in, in, our, in our efforts to support the C40, for example, the, the financial, financial uh, facility there. Um, there we really try to come up with schemes where the international multilateral level is cooperating with national and with local governments, involving the, the civil society, involving the business sector and so on. It is, as I said in the beginning, it's highly complex um, and don't be astonished or surprised if you even go to one of the C40s, which are the most powerful cities in the world, and you will see how difficult it is even to implement a uh, metro bus line or something like this is one, uh, in one of our, our big cities in, for example, in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. <coughs> I can't agree more with what you have said. Uh, since I really believe that we need to try new forms of cooperation between local le le governments and understand the difference that we have between national and subnational governments in order to achieve NDCs and SDGs mm -hmm. at the time. Thank you. Well, Amar, so we have the last question for you and just a couple of minutes to go. Could you give us your opinion on what is uh, sorry, what do we have to do about the removal of subsidies for fossil fuels, fuels, and I would add carbon pricing as well. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. So first of all, uh, fossil fuel subsidies are negative carbon pricing. Uh, so you know, in a world where we are looking to increase carbon prices, uh, you know, first step is eliminating fossil fuel subsidies because they are a significant driver of the bad incentives that we have. Second, fossil fuel subsidies are the major source of pollution. Mm. Okay. And, you know, of course, the burning of coal, and there is no such thing as clean coal, sorry, uh, you know, <laughs> is a major problem. And who pays the price for it? The poor and the vulnerable, and as well as the effects of climate change itself. Third, as we heard from Dr. Yoshino, there are other solutions now on the table. You know, there is distributed clean energy solutions that can produce good power, and we know we can have not only clean power outside, we need to have better clean sources of energy inside the home that particularly kill women. So we can do, we have better solutions on the table. Fourth, eliminating subsidies releases a huge amount of revenue huge amount of revenue, maybe a trillion dollars, okay? Who are the beneficiaries of these subsidies? Vested interests in the fossil fuel energy sector and largely so-called middle class. The poor really don't benefit that much from these subsidies. So yes, you need to protect the poor, but with the, with the revenues that are set, you can provide better supply of fuel, and yes, you can provide targeted solutions. It's high time to remove, eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. Now, what can the G20 do? So the G7 set a target of eliminating fossil fuel subsidies completely by 2025. The G20 has not followed suit. So we need to raise the level of ambition in the G20. That's the, what the G20 has to do. Now, let me end with carbon pricing. Uh, my colleague, Otmar Edenhofer, is not here but he and his colleagues have produced an excellent brief on carbon pricing. It shows you how powerful it is as an instrument, but how also complex the political economy challenges are in order to tackle. The reality is we have 70 jurisdictions that have some kind of carbon pricing, but the level of that carbon price is simply too low to produce the incentives for transformative change. The High-Level Commission of Carbon Prices, which was co-chaired by uh, Joe Stiglitz and Nick Stern, came up with a recommendation that we need a credible price in the order of $40 to $80 per ton 
moving to $100 mm. per ton. There are private companies that, that are doing that. You know, there are private companies that are doing it, but the, the public sector is lagging. So we really need to move much more aggressively on carbon pricing than we are right now. Yeah. Thanks, Omar. <laughs> Well, I hope you had a good uh, idea of what we have been discussing during the whole year. Thank you to this panel. And I would like to close this uh, plenary session with a very good news. And it's a formal announcement that after negotiating for, so, for, for some time, uh, the C20, the V20, and the T20 have a joint statement on climate action that it's open and will be published this morning in all these uh, web pages, so you will have access to it. We will have the time and the opportunity to read it tomorrow in the, in the parallel session on climate. So thank you very much and congratulations. What a great first plenary session. Many thanks to all our speakers for taking part. We will now have our first coffee break of the day, which will take place in the Plaza Seca. That's on the ground floor. After the break, there will be a number of sessions you can attend. Please see your programs for more information and where are they located. This will be at the floors fifth and sixth and of course also here at Sala Argentina. If you require assistance, feel free to reach out to any T20 staff who will be delighted to help you. We will meet here again exactly at 14, that's 2 p.m. after lunch. See you later and enjoy your coffee.